Welcome to the Salk Institute's Where Cures Begin podcast, where scientists talk about breakthrough discoveries with your hosts, Ali Akmal and Brittany Fair. I'm here with Salk Vice President, Chief Science Officer, and Professor Martin Hetzer. He uses a variety of approaches to pose questions about how adult tissues are maintained and repaired and why long-lived cells fail to work properly as a cell ages. One of his recent discoveries is the surprising fact that organs, such as the liver and pancreas, contain cells that are a mosaic of different ages. Dr. Hetzer, welcome to Work Cures Begin. Hello. So tell me how you became interested in science to begin with. Yeah, I grew up in a rural area in, in, in Austria, and my grandparents were close by, so I spent a lot of time with them. And my, de- my grandpa was a, a veterinarian, and so he took me different farms in the, in the, in the area. He would mainly treat uh, farm animals, so he worked with you know, horses, cows, and uh, not so much with uh, uh, you know, birds and, and, and cats. But, but this was, uh, uh, from a very early age, I was exposed to farm life and, and animals, and, and I think a, that I think triggered some interest in, in, you know, in nature and biology. But I had someone who explained things to me that uh, most people couldn't because they just saw, oh, here's an animal that is suffering or here is a certain occurrence within this farm, but nobody mm-hmm. knows what's going on. And he mm-hmm. would come and explain, oh, that's what's going on and here's what we're going to do. So there's also this, this idea that you can intervene, you can, you can do something about it, but you need to know about this. And, and I was very fortunate that I had him explaining things to me he just didn't do it but he went down into details and then i thought influenced by him that i would and i went to med school for two years and i thought i wanted to be a physician but then i realized no that's actually probably not the right thing i just really got fascinated by with research and then and then i switched completely because i started up so md phd program but then i really just no i won't i don't want to i can't be a physician i mm-hmm. really want to be a, a scientist So um, how would you describe your area of research at Salk? I started out as a geneticist and cell biologist. Um, so when I came to the Salk, I was really focusing on questions that are related to cell proliferation, related to cancer. And this was actually the reason I got interested in, in, in cell biology in the first place, because the cells, uh, and especially the, the nuclei, the cell nuclei, are very highly perturbed in, in cancer cells. So that got my interest. But then over the years, as my group grew and we made several discoveries that link cell biology to the longevity of organisms, we got more and more interested in uh, research of aging. And now we're very much focusing on aging and, and age-related diseases and really try to understand how the normal aging process is actually linked to, uh, in some cases, to the development of diseases. And we have a large population that's aging, you know, in a big cohort, the boomers. Yeah, the boomers, yeah. So many societies really um, are either already sort of, you know, have a very high percentage of elderly and people are 65 and older. That's where we typically see age-related diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular problems, cognitive impairment uh, really increase. So some populations already are countries face that, that issue, but many, many more will face that issue in the coming decades. So it's really uh, critical that we understand um, and, and are able to distinguish between healthy and pathological aging. You actually had a paper, I think it was in 2018, where you were using machine learning algorithms to try to predict people's age. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, many, many model systems and organisms that you can use to study uh, aging. But in the end, we want to understand, like, how do humans age? Mm-hmm. And, and that turns out to be still a very, very poorly understood, uh, you know, certainly process. But also, it turns out that we have really uh, not many tools to determine and measure in a you know, very quantitative m- manner how fast a person is aging. Mm-hmm. So you start out with you know, some high functional capacity and this deteriorates as you get older. And it gives you, and this is typically uh, represented sort of in a linear form. So that 
gives you the impression, well, maybe aging is a really linear decline. So basically we age with the same rate as we get older. Mm -hmm. But we really don't know that, right? It might be that in the 2030s, we don't age very much. And mm -hmm. then as we get older, maybe hit certain age, then really aging is accelerated. And so while we all agree that the chronological age, so the, the number that is on your birthday cake is not really um, useful because you can have an 80-year-old who just qualifies for a marathon and you have an 80-year-old who you know, spends his or her time in a, in, a, in a nursing home. So chronological age is not useful. And, and, and so how do you determine the biological age of a person? But what we wanted to do is uh, see, can we uh, get molecular signatures? Um, and, and in this particular case, it was, can we predict the biological age of gene expression patterns that we would find in, in this particular case, skin fibroblasts of people from different ages? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, we analyzed cells, these were fibroblasts from the donors uh, with ages I think less than 10 years up to 90 years of age. Mm -hmm and used a technique called RNA-seq, which allows you to quantify the levels of uh, RNA molecules in a given cell, which is um, very characteristic for a cell type, and then ask, well, are there any changes mm -hmm. in this transcriptional profile of a cell that would correlate with, with age? And amazingly, it does. Mm -hmm. And what they found is then that Yes, there is a clear uh, correlation between specific genes as they change with age that allow you to sort of predict like how old a person is. When Hetzer uses the phrase predict how old, he means that the lab's algorithm based on the protein cells are making can guess the age of the cell's owner. By looking at this cellular data, their algorithm was able to correctly guess people's age to within a few years. But what's perhaps even more interesting is that uh, there are some people, some individuals who predict younger or mm -hmm. older mm -hmm. than they, the chronological age suggests. And so, so this is now a, a tool that we hope we can use to now say, okay, here we have a, a cohort of 50-year-olds, the chronological age of 50, but they predict younger and compare them to also 50-year-olds who predict older. And now we can ask, okay, what's different between them? Fascinating. Uh -huh. And so now we have a tool, hopefully, to use this predictor to drill down on biology and really understand, okay, why do some people age more successfully than, than others? Mm -hmm. And the ultimate goal, obviously, is then to use then interventions. Can we uh, either change people's or come up with recommendations to change people's lifestyle or dietary changes or even pharmacological interventions to prove the aging process of individuals. That's still you know, far way out, but that's mm -hmm. sort of the ultimate vision behind all this research. The next step is then to identify a person's biological age. Now we would like to know, okay, well, now what's the sort of health status or the aging um, trajectory of individual organs? Because again, it's another big unknown where, how different organs age. And we, we, not only, you know, my lab, but many other labs have, you know, clearly shown that different organs, such as the brain or the heart, they have very different aging mechanisms, which is probably not so surprising, right? Because the, the brain is, is largely composed of, of cells that are what we refer to post-mitotic. So they are, you know, typically as old as yours, so they never divide. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have other uh, tissues such as uh, intestine or skin that is constantly renewed from stem cells. Mm -hmm. it, it's really remarkable that we are sort of a mosaic of, of cells that are literally as old as we are. And this is still, for me as a cell biologist, really remarkable that how can a cell like a ner nerve cell in the brain live for 100 years? And then you have on the other extreme, you have cells such as you know, blood cells, immune cells, or intestinal cells that can be, you know, that are week old. Mm -hmm. So we have this, 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 this huge spectrum of cellular longevity that we really don't understand uh, in, the, in the overall context of aging. Do you think we'll see sort of groundbreaking discoveries in, in this area in the next, say, 10 years? Yeah, I do, I do think the answer is yes. I think there, there is already you know, great progress being made in, in identifying 
really like the key areas, almost like in or analogous to the cancer community, who over the last you know decades identified really the key drivers of of of, of cancer. But I think we will gain important insights mm-hmm. into these early stages of of, of age related diseases, which I think will change the way we look at many of those diseases, but also hopefully deliver uh, some some meaningful interventions. In your role as Salk's chief science officer, maybe you'll have a chance to influence the direction of these sorts of studies. Can you talk a little bit about what that position is, what your responsibilities are? What I see the CSO office doing is providing a service to uh, the scientists here, both in the academic world. So a big part of responsibilities are um, things that relate to you know, academic appointments. This is from recruitment to uh, retention, making sure people have what they, what they need uh, so, so that this runs as seamless as it can run. And then the other big part is, is the operational aspect. So do people have the space they need? That's a big uh, part. We, but also that people have access to the technology that they need, and both internally, but then there we have also a need to access technology that is not located at, at Salk. So we are involved in uh, developing agreements with other neighboring institutions so that people have all the technological and also access to clinical samples, for instance, that they need to, uh, to do their research. And so a lot of my job is also working with our neighbors to think about how we can work together. Uh, Because one big advantage that we have here in San Diego is that we have extremely strong research institute, biotech and pharma in very close proximity. Um, You know, we literally walk across the street for everyone who knows La Jolla across North Torrey Pines and then you're on UCSD campus, you walk a minute longer and then you you run into script scientists and uh, you drive a minute and you are in um, some of the hottest uh, biotech hubs. And so this makes San Diego such a wonderful research environment. And and since SOC is a relatively small research institute and very diverse in its research programs, we really want to have as many meaningful partnerships with our neighbors as we can because this is part of our success. Yeah. And then how did you end up at SOC? Before I came here, I actually wanted to... I thought I would go to the Bay Area if I, you know, because I was I didn't at UCSF and I really liked San Francisco. But then I have to say when I when I interviewed here at Salk, really things fell into place for me and 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 I just immediately not only you know was impressed by the architecture but really the people I met. I was just really blown away by by the in, the, the conversations I had with faculty members mm-hmm. here. I would talk to not only cell biologists, which was at that time really my main interest, mm-hmm. but I would talk to people about computational neuroscience. And I thought like, wow, uh-huh. which I knew nothing about. So uh-huh. like, wow. And so it was sort of, I thought, okay, what, how would that, coming to SOG, how would that change me and how would that change my research? And I found that so much more exciting than going to a classical cell biology mm-hmm. department mm-hmm. where I would be surrounded by, you know, for sure many people who would think like me, but I was sort of, I almost looked at this as an experiment, like what would happen to me if I joined the SOC? And so that was a main driver. What do you enjoy doing when you're not working? So running is, is something I, I, I always enjoy and, uh, enjoy. and then being from Austria, I mean, skiing mm-hmm. is, is, a, is an absolute <laughs> must. So at least <laughs> twice a year we mm-hmm. have to go skiing. Uh, and And... I think that's probably my favorite sport oh, ever. Uh, uh-huh. It's just uh, in part because we, both my wife and I, learned it when we were really young. Uh-huh. So we, you know, it's it's very natural to us. But it's just it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful sport. And here in California, or in the broader US, there's so many great opportunities to go skiing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so those are you know some of the physical parts. And and another form of for me meditation is to to play the guitar. Mm-hmm. So that's also music has a has a uh, has a way to. Yeah, rewire your brain and your, and your thoughts. Acoustic or electric or both? Uh, well, both, but mo- mostly electric guitar mm-hmm. now. Uh, both my son actually and I, we, we go to the same guitar teacher mm-hmm. <laughs> every other week. And my son is much better than I am. But... <laughs> so do you have jam sessions with your son? 
Yeah, we do. I mean, yeah. he has. A, it depends on on his level of, of patience. I mean, he, but yeah, I mean, we we talk a lot about music, and it's certainly something that 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 connects us. We've covered a lot of ground today. Is there anything that you wanted to share that we didn't get a chance to share? I, I just want to express again, like how wonderful of a, of a place that is, and and how wonderful uh, La Jolla and, and San Diego is in in, in providing an an extremely vibrant and rich research mm -hmm. environment combined with you know being close to the ocean and having a wonderful relaxed lifespan so mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel it's not an advertisement like you know advertising <laughs> sort but I, I really feel very passionate about this uh -huh. and and i think it's it i'm just amazed uh, that i'm able to come to work in a place like this mm -hmm. and uh and and yeah, and I, I encourage people who don't know the Salk just to come and, 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 and visit us. It's just a really spectacular place. Yes, although we're temporarily closed to the public due to the pandemic, people can check our website, salk.edu, to see when we've reopened. Thank you, Dr. Hetzer, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> Join us next time for more cutting-edge Salk science. At Salk, world-renowned scientists work together to explore big, bold ideas. From cancer to Alzheimer's, aging to climate change. Where Cures Begin is a production of the Salk Institute's Office of Communications. To learn more about the research discussed today, visit salk.edu slash podcast.